This week's show with Jen Goodwin is sponsored by the Embroiderers Guild of America, a community of stitch-minded people who inspire passion for the needle arts through education and the celebration of its heritage. You can learn more at egausa.org. Lots going on there. really encourage you to consider joining the uh, Embroiderers Guild, uh, either as a member at large or as a member and then uh, uh, joining a local chapter. Even if you're not a member, though, much to, uh, much to get out of the organization. There, there are several free holiday projects and inspiration. Uh, well, yeah, there's lots of inspiration there, but holiday projects are free, and you don't have to be a member. All you have to do is sign up for their newsletter, which is a good thing anyway. Uh, so go check that out. And uh, inspiration, uh, just go to the gallery section. Just spend a half hour. I dare you to spend a half an hour uh, only in the gallery section. Uh, just some amazing work there. Online classes coming up, Kimono Revisited with John Waddell, and that registration has already started and ends January 6th. Coming soon, Brian the Bee with Hazel Blomkamp. Oh, don't want to miss that one. I've seen that one. That's a beauty. Uh, a lot of fun, too. Registration starts January 6th and ends February 3, and there are only 100 student slots there. So Brian the Bee with Hazel Blomkamp, only 100 slots available. So get on, in on that quickly. And then uh, check out the lightning rounds. The next lightning round registration starts March 1. Uh, four new classes, Touch of Fall, Ancestry, Desert Strands, and Shimmering Dream. And then, of course, the National Seminar will be in Chicago. Uh, theme is The Magnificent Stitch. And that will be September 1 to September 5, and it's hosted by the Great Lakes region. Go to EGAUSA.org, uh, check it out, uh, spend some time with the website. I think you'll be impressed, and I really encourage you to join the EGA. They are really doing some great things for needleworkers uh, of all types, all techniques and all types. And now we'll enjoy our conversation with our guest this week, Jen Goodwin. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. You're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, Jen Goodwin from Jen Goodwin Embroidery. Hi, Jen. Hi, yeah. How are you? We're doing okay. Thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me on. Uh, the burning question how many hours of meetings to come up with your company name, Jen Goodwin Embroidery? Oh, it took me so much time to consider uh, is how to brand yourself. <laughs> I'll, I'll go with the easy option, my name. Yeah, because so, I, I always wonder when it's like that, did you try 50 different things and say, oh, forget it, I'll just use my name, or did you just get smart and do your, your name right out of the gate? I figured I'd use my name right from the get-go because I want to establish me as me. So yeah. hiding behind a name doesn't do that for me. Yep. <laughs> you know, I, I want my artwork to be by Jen Goodwin. Therefore, it makes sense to tie everything into my name. So, yeah, from the get-go, I've been Jen Goodwin Embroidery. Okay, so zero energy wasted on that. Good move. Yeah, no, straight in there. Straight in. We're done. <laughs> yep. Now, RSN, I am always intrigued by people who have gone through the Royal School and uh, because you guys are always so interesting and so versatile. And how, how is it that you got involved in that? I, I've always stitched. I've been stitching since I was about six or seven. My mom got me started with stitching. And it got to a point where we were looking at degrees and what was I going to do? And she was like, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I guess I'll do a sort of some sort of sensible science degree I'm not too bad in that field when I make the effort and she went is that what you really want to do and I said no I'd like to sew um and she's quite unusual because she went let's go find somewhere oh so my. we went off yeah no she literally she wanted to be an art teacher and her parents wouldn't let her so when I said I want to do something obscure she went okay then um so we went to the pool careers advice so near where I live the careers advice center and I told them what I wanted to do and they went, oh, dear, no. Um, and they gave me a sheet <laughs> and told me to go away. And by chance, the RSN address was on the back. 
and this was before emails, so I hand wrote them a letter and I said, do you teach people to sew? And they sent me some leaflets and I, I wrote back and went, could I apply for the certificate, please, and see if I'm good enough for the apprenticeship? And they went, apply for the apprenticeship. The worst we'll do is say, go away for a year and we'll talk to you when you've got some more experience. And uh, two interviews later and I was in. So, um, <laughs> Wow, that's yeah, fabulous. I feel it was really, really lucky that I, it just all fell into place. Well, what's really cool is that your mother was supportive and, and, and opened those doors for you. Because, yeah, typical parent thing is, no, get a degree in something that will make you money. So that's great. From day one, she's been like, yep, go for it. And when I had a sort of a sensible part-time job for years, and when I decided it was time to give up my sensible part-time job, she was like, okay then. So she's always been <laughs> this little champion in a corner going, just go and do it then. Uh, so, so I do. <laughs> well, that's, I'm very... that's, that's just terrific to, to be in an art field and have that kind of support behind you, knowing that you're not out there hanging by yourself. Yeah. Oh, no, she, she's always been really encouraging. It's brilliant. In <laughs> the RSN uh, years, um, full-time at it, or were you working and doing that as you could fit it in? How did you approach that? Uh, well, the apprenticeship was three years full-time, so I, I did the apprenticeship. So I, uh, I started 20 years ago now, and it was three years full-time, and at the end, I kind of played with doing some other things and then I kind of got back into teaching again. Um, so there've been some times there, some times away, but it's, it's somewhere that drags a lot of us back you know, voluntarily, you know, you just kind of gravitate back to it. Yeah. So it's been a bit of both. Yeah. I, it, every time I talk to somebody who's been through the program, you can tell that, it it's it weeds itself out because it's so intense and you do so much needlework that you quickly learn at least my perception is you quickly learn whether you want really want to do it or not and um uh, those who come all the way through are obviously committed because if you want to do that much stitching for that many hours then you uh you are obviously in love with it yes yeah, there are there are two breeds. You get to the end and you never want to stitch again, or you get to the end and you go, oh, "Where's my next project?" Uh, <laughs> there, is, there is two breeds, and a lot of us, there are some who walk away from the RSN and feel that they've got a different path, and there are those of us, some of us who just doesn't matter how hard we sort of say, "Right, we're going in the other direction." We kind of always swing back to the RSN. So I've given up trying to even go in a different direction. I'm very much RSN through and through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not a bad thing to be, I don't think. No. Right, right. Um, I love them. So so I, I do. I, I'm RSN through and through. Yeah. Now you mentioned in uh, a couple of ladies that you collaborate with or continue to be connected with, one Helen McCook, who uh, we talked to some time ago, Tremendous lady. Is is there a, a community? Is there just an ongoing community of people who've been through the program who just are constantly in touch? Oh yeah, I mean Helen McCook and I, we did the apprenticeship together, and we actually shared a house together, so we're oh. actually very, very close friends. So <laughs> yeah, she's 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 a fabulous friend who I adore. Uh, but the tutors, we are always in touch. We've got our own WhatsApp group. So like any friend group, there are some you're closer to than others. But if you're an RSN tutor, you're an RSN tutor and you are part of the, the gang. And we hang on to the gang very tightly. We love everyone. So it, it's very much that's the community that we are very supportive of one another. Yeah, that's I mean, that's so neat to have that uh, that base as you go all, each go off to do your own thing, to have that uh, um uh, the friendships, but but also just the collaborative and, and artistic base. That, it uh, is. Yeah. Question. You you ask the group, and someone somewhere is going to have that answer for you. So we're always happy to share and collaborate and do what we can for one another. Mm hmm. Oh, that's terrific. Now, when you uh, like to do your own business, when you, when you get out of the school, do they help you in terms of of handling a business in addition to the needlework? Or is that something where you have to pretty much learn that on your own or all of you guys collaborating? I think when we came through the apprenticeship, we got 
the very basics of how to organise your invoices in and out, etc. But it was left to us to work out our own business models. So I think every one of us is going to have a different approach to running our businesses. Um, I think we are far more open with the new future tutors about how to approach things. But it's a different beast. And, and a lot of us now have established businesses that we're happy to share yeah. our experience with. So I think we've all had to come at it from different angles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's the tough part. I mean, you, you, obviously, you, you all know how to use a needle and thread. But uh, when you go to set, do your business, well, at least they're giving you some background in terms of invoicing and things. But there's still just all the uh, intangible things of running a business uh, that you pretty much have to learn on your own. So it's um, it's it good that you're in It is challenging. I always knew I wanted my own business at some point, so I trained as a bookkeeper. So just because I don't like the idea, well, I never liked the idea of paying an accountant. However, I hate doing my accounts, so I'm giving in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just hate doing my accounts, even though I know what I'm doing. Uh, so it's things like that. It's know when to hand off a job to somebody else. Know what you want to keep control of. Um, and it is it's trial and error and finding out what works for you in the way that you like to work. Yeah. Now, did you when you started your business, uh, was it soon after you left the uh, school or... Was that a gradual thing? It was a gradual thing. I would say it's been about 10 years now that I would be working under the Jen Goodwin embroidery heading. Um, so it, it was definitely gradual after the apprenticeship. And year on year, it's definitely expanded and I'm doing more. And I've definitely got a better business head on me now mm -hmm. than when I started up. But I think that's going to be the same for everyone. If you are not doing better with your business however many years in, then something somewhere is going very wrong. Yeah. So um, it, it's, it's been gradual. It's been a slow build, but it's getting to a point where it's, it's, it's sustaining itself well. Well, 10 years for any small business is a huge milestone. Uh, it is going to be next year is going to be my 10th year in the business. Uh, I think I'm about eight or nine years full time self-employed. So I think I've got another year to go on full-time self-employed. That, that <laughs> milestone I like. Uh, <laughs> so, so when did you start your web page? Um, the website's been around, I don't know. Um, it's been around for a long time, and it's okay. something I'm constantly working on. It's definitely improved a lot this year. It's been through a redesign. Um, okay. So it's definitely a lot slicker this year. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's yeah, very was, nice. Yeah, yeah, I was poking around on it this morning, and it's just, it's just very, very well done. And I'm just very curious because that was something, um, a comment someone made that it's, you know, if you're not into doing the sort of web pages business, you know, this is that's a problem area. It's kind of hard to set that up, and and just how did you go about that? Did you hire somebody else, or did you um, just? It started out as a word, well, it is a WordPress site. So to start with, it was very much all of me. Mm -hmm. And I am fairly tech savvy, so that's not too bad. But I also knew I couldn't get the look I wanted. So it was first handed off to somebody else to do the design work about four years ago. And I wanted it to be updated so it was in line with the book this year. So at the start of the first lockdown in the UK, I actually got in touch with him again, A, because it's a good time to put work to other small businesses, um, and B, I knew I couldn't get what I wanted. So I, I, it's one of those jobs I'm happy to pay someone else to do. So I will do the content. Design work is done by someone else. Okay. Yeah. I was just very curious about that. I think it, it's there are some jobs you have to hold your hand up and go, I know what I want. I can't do it myself. Someone <laughs> else can do it for me. So I think some things you should be investing in. Yeah, and, and websites are one of those. You can you can go down that hole and never come back. It's um, yep. yeah, waste it's a lot. lot of work. There are still things that I want to tweak that will be happening in the two weeks I've got between sort of Christmas and New Year. I'm going to revisit some stuff, some new photographs. So the content I'm happy to play with, but actual design work I can't achieve what I want. So. I know someone else. <laughs> you have people. <laughs> Very useful people, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
Now, I'm most interested, you, you now work out of the Walford Millcraft. Uh, yes. Uh, talk about the transition to that, because that looks to be an ideal place for your business. Oh, uh, if the RSN is kind of my spiritual home, Walford Mill is kind of my heart. It's, 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 yeah, it's my favorite place. So I've been teaching there for about eight and a half years. And when I was just a visiting tutor, one of the staff went, we used to have a third on-site maker here. If you'd like to consider moving in, you know, we, we'd really love to talk to you. Um, and so I kind of approached them all ready to kind of pitch. Thank you. Thank you for considering me and my work. And we sat down for a coffee and they went, thank you for considering us. So um, I got straight in. And it's, it's a creative craft gallery. So everyone there is a maker. But 18 months ago, it went from being funded by the Arts Council and our local council to being taken over by myself and the other makers who work on site. So it was in financial difficulties. It was about to fold. The council were going to take the keys off us. And we thought, we've got to try and rescue this place. So um, we took over a charity, as you do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, my. It's my heart. They're my favorite people who work there. We're all makers of different things. So there's a mezzanine floor above me with a silk weaver who she's on site with her loom. We've got a wood engraver who's opposite me. We've got jewelers on site. A printing studio is about to move in upstairs. I'm really excited. Um, and it's just there's makers everywhere. And it's an open studio setting. So anyone who visits the mill can come and see any of us working on any day. So it demystifies craft. So much craft is, is confused. People don't understand so many crafts. And so it's a great way for people to come and learn how traditional craft are made. So I, I love that element of being able to talk to anyone about what I do. So it's, it's a glorious environment. We have an awful lot of fun. It is very, very collaborative. We're always swapping projects. I, I just, I go on literally for the entire time about the joys of the mill. Uh, well, no, it's, it's fantastic because I've, I've encountered that kind of a setup before and it seems to have say a four or five year life and then uh yeah funding usually it's money but uh for some reason or another that just comes apart and it always seems like such an excellent idea for all the reasons you just described and uh it sounds like then you, it was it was at the doorstep of death and uh and you guys put it on on the on the on its feet again is it a, is it a teaching thing as much as it is a creating operation or is it really creating and then uh, you guys selling your product elsewhere it's it's a mixture of all those things so we're an educational charity with craft at our heart so a lot of us teach on site we have got a teaching space uh, and the act of people coming in and seeing us working is also educational but it is also open working studio, so anyone can come and buy from any of us. We have a gallery space. Uh, during twice a year, we have exhibitions where we have other makers work in that we sell and we run it as a little shop. So it's all of those things, as well as being a creative hub where we all go to work. So, so, the, it, it, so you, have, you have several revenue streams going then? Yes, yeah, we do, yeah. And we've gone from being in a financial hole to actually having um, spare money sitting around. Oh, no, um, not, not that. Wow. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so and we do have a glorious board of trustees who are so supportive. So when we did try and take over, we went to the trustees and we went, would you support us doing this? And they went, yes. So we don't have complete free reign, but we have trustees who also act in on behalf of the charity. So it's, it's, I, I love the place. It's just a glorious, cooperative, creative, silly, fun filled hub where I get to go and play every day at doing what I like. It's great. That's true. Now, I, I have visions of an old mill building, 
that's been uh, cleaned out, fixed up, and repurposed. Is that pretty much what it is? Yes, it dates from the 1700s. It used to be an old flour mill. The mill race runs under my studio, so if the water gets too high, my studio floods. Uh, <laughs> it's very, very oh. common. Oh, I, I accept the flooding because I wouldn't move. I love it. Um, <laughs> it's freezing, absolutely freezing all the time. Uh, we've got, yeah, there's no mill wheel anymore, but we do have glass panels in some of the floors. So you can see where the mill wheel used to be. So you can see the mill race running underneath. So it has been very well repurposed. We don't have much of the milling equipment left. But it's, it's, well, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I just was curious about the classes you offer there, because I was looking at that, and that's kind of, when we have classes here, they're, you know, for a specific item, but it looks like you give, like, studio time in your space. Is that correct? I do. I run a class once a week. I have two sessions in that class. I used to give them all set projects, but I felt they all needed pushing. My students have been with me for a very long time now. So a lot of them have been with me that full eight years. And I felt it was time that they all got pushed. So um, I now make them choose their own designs. Much as we do at the RSN on the certificate and diploma, they choose what they want to do. And I will help them make it reality. So I like the fact that everyone's being pushed that little bit. I've got some students who will always turn around and go, I want another kit. That's great. I will teach that. But then I've got others who will turn around and go, so I've had this idea. I'm like, great. Let's run with the idea. So it's a bit of both. So, Gary, do you know anything that's like that in the U.S., that people who offer classes like that? That seems very European or something to me because we don't I, – I can't think of anything like that. Um, I, I really don't. Uh, I mean, the San Francisco School of Needlework and Design comes to mind. Uh, but I don't know that much about what they do. But, yeah, it seems like a really unique setup. And um, uh, I just I love the ability to have so many artists in one place and the collaboration and uh, uh, the, edu the, the learning and sharing that must go on has got to be exciting every day. It's, it makes me a better maker. When I moved in, I was doing all right. I was turning out some nice work. But being surrounded by other people who are at the top of their game, you kind of look at your work and go, I can do better than this. So <laughs> make me better. I felt I needed to be better. <laughs> that's what, you know, if, if that's what drives you, yeah, that's great. You know, the, everybody, you know, the, the old, all, uh, all boats rise in a high tide kind of thing. It's um... Exactly. I think you need people around you to push you to be better at what you do. And even if they're in different disciplines, that doesn't mean it doesn't have crossover into your own work. Mm -hmm. So I find the fact that I've got people of different disciplines, that's irrelevant. I have Robin, who's a wood engraver, who can look at a piece of black and white work and immediately go, your tone is right or your tone is wrong. I've got someone upstairs who dyes and weaves all her own silk. If my color choices are off, she can tell me. And vice versa, I can do the same with their work. So I love the fact that actually people of different disciplines can actually alter your own perception of your work. So to me, I think it's, it's a really valuable resource to tap into. I think we get stuck just looking at other stitches at times when you stitch. Yes. And I think sometimes actually that looking outside the box from a different discipline, it's actually incredibly useful. Oh, I, I agree 100%. I think that that's uh, key to uh, moving forward and, and increasing creativity and, and coming up with new things. Uh, that's what, what I love about the needlework uh, hobby industry is there are so many uh, disciplines, so many techniques that you can draw from. And, uh, and if you, if you, you know, if you're hundred percent cross stitcher and never look elsewhere, you never really get to see what else could be and how it might influence your, your cross stitch work if, if that's what you're doing. But, uh, there just, there's just so many other things and you, you have the equivalent of that at the mill there with, mm -hmm. with all this different disciplines. Yeah. You can, you can really draw from that. It is. It's really useful. Do you right, guys? Yeah. Go ahead. 
I was just going to say, and it, it, it makes you ask that what if question. What if I do this? What if I, I try something what, different? What if is just, it's, it's a little dangerous, but in a good way. Um, <laughs> right. I love that little question mark when it pops up in my head. I wonder what happens if. I love right. that. It's the thinking outside the box. Where can I go with it? Yeah, I, I love that. That's so neat. Do you guys treat that as a, as a nine to five office kind of thing, or is it pretty much an around the clock drop in, drop out? I'll be here all day. Um, that kind of a thing. It's actually both. So because we usually are outside of lockdown conditions, we're usually open between 10 and five. So if we're going into work, that's our work day. But that doesn't mean that we're not there at odd times as well. And even though we can't currently open to the public, we're still using our studio spaces. So it's kind of both. I've got there are some makers on site. We've got a willow weaver who loves working early in the morning. And she's often in her studio by 6 a.m. But she's done by 10 and she's leaving. So we we work with our own schedules really but if we are based on the shop floor and we need to be open then most of us will be in during opening hours all right now we've got a silk weaver a willow maker a wood carver an embroiderer yeah. yes holy smokes <laughs> a pastel pencil artist someone who makes artwork and sculptures out of driftwood a silversmith an aluminium metal smith um, and as I say, we're about to get a screen printing studio upstairs as well. Wow. And we've got an animator as well. <laughs> That's fabulous. What a great combination. It's, I it's, love it. It's randomly come together naturally. I don't want to say that we've actually gone touting for people. People have just randomly turned up and gone, have you got space? I'm like, yes, come in, come and join us. So it's just naturally grown and it's a really good mix. I'd be there for a week. <laughs> yeah, lovely. You'd be more than welcome to visit. <laughs> well, and you offer children's classes also. I mean, I, there are children's classes on site. Taught when they, by and that, someone else. I don't teach children. I don't like children. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hansel and Gretel. Um, yeah, but but they do offer them there, and I think that's. That, that, to me, is great, too, because if you have children looking at things, they might poke your, their head and say, oh, look at what she does. That's embroidery. That, that's different, you know, than what, you know, the, just the plain old cross-stitch stuff that, like, what we see around here. Or it's just a different way, different stitching than, than maybe they're used to. I think that's fabulous. It is. Get the younger generation in. The classes are run by our education officer, who's also um, a collage artist. I've forgotten her. We've also got a natural diet. I'm forgetting how many people we've got on site. Um, <laughs> and the artist. I've forgotten the downstairs guys. But Sarah used to work in um, education. She used to teach to A level and GCSE level, so sort of higher end children's education. Um, and she got disenchanted with uh, the education system, but still wants to teach. So she runs her classes outside of the true education system as a complementary side of things. So she tries to push children in a good way to look at art in a different way, but without having to tick those goals that the exams and the education system push for. So it's it's a really good way of of sharing different techniques again, bringing kids in at an early age to start seeing craft and art. Mm -hmm. Right. What an incredible operation. That is just fantastic. But lovely. I, I really am very lucky where I'm based. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Wow. All right. So let's talk about Jen Goodwood embroidery. So you, okay. you, you come out of the uh, Royal school and obviously anybody who does that, uh, is uh, rather adept at several techniques, but you seem to have uh, honed in on black work. What is it about black work? I, I've i always had a love for black work. Um, yeah, it's always, because I think, because I, I started with cross stitch, I think it's the most natural free embroidery style that's related to cross stitch. So I love all traditional work, but black work is one that 
I'm always drawn back to, and for as long as I've produced embroidery kits, there's always been at least one black work kit at, around. So it is a technique that I favour. Uh, and I just, I find it very rhythmical. It's it's very soothing to stitch. But I also love working to create something very intricate and tonal so you can make it as complex as you want it to be. And I enjoy that. And uh, is is there some art background that uh, helps you with your design, or is it just a natural thing for you? I would say I come from the make it up as you go along school. There we go. Uh, I I've I always felt that my own drawing wasn't that good until I realised that actually my style of drawing is very stylized. So when I do draw, it's it's not representational of what I see. It's very stylized and simplified down and once I decided that a I liked the way I drew and um I recognized the style that worked for me then I I just go with that I I sit down I doodle until I get something I like or I work from a photograph that I've either taken or I've bought a license for and that's when I just kind of look for something that appeals to me um so those are my two approaches to design when when you work from a photograph to black work, what what is that process? Make a black and white uh, photocopy and go from there. How, how do you make that conversion? Because if if it's a, a color image, you know you, that's to me that's relatively straightforward. But to go to black and white and and get the shading right and the textures is got to be I, I think an, an extra challenge. Um, I tend to either look for an image that is black and white or I convert an image to black and white. And from there, I always take out my outlines, the, the lines I want to work from. And then I sit and I actually sketch in the design so I understand where the shading is, where the lights and the darks are. So it's a learning process by doing that. I'm learning my image before I ever put a stitch in. And it actually makes the stitching a lot easier if you've learned your image first. So you've just got to learn to observe what you're looking at. A lot of the time when we work from images or two outlines, we stitch what we think we've seen, not what we're actually seeing. So it's training yourself to actually really recognize that you are stitching what you see. So I never really put more than two or three stitches in without looking back at my image. So don't ever fall into that trap of just stitching, stitching, stitching. I'm always referencing back and forth by eye so that I know I'm stitching what I can see. Oh, okay, so do you design on the computer? No. Okay. No, I was always taught to design by hand, so I still design by hand. Uh, okay. I will chart individual patterns on a computer so that people can read them clearly afterwards but I will not do a chart of a finished design because I think you need to understand that your first stitch can go wherever you want it to go. And from there, the pattern fills out from that naturally. So I don't really do much on the computer. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Everybody, everybody has a different approach. That's fun. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> nope. Sorry, RSN that approach is you, you just, <laughs> there's your image, your pattern's going in that area. Start stitching it, shade it as you go. Yeah. But see, it's it's interesting. So you've clung to that, yet some people will evolve away from that, uh, you know, that basic yeah. approach. So it's it was just interesting that that, that still works for you, uh, yet, you know, the computer has to come into play somewhere along the way. It does come into play, usually after something's been stitched. I... I'm surprised at the time I trained, I did not think I would turn myself into a traditionalist, but I am a grumpy traditionalist. I like <laughs> traditional. I see nothing wrong with traditional. It's worked this way for a fair old time. Let's carry on being traditional. So I, I think that if we become too dependent on our computers for design work, then the actual skills of being able to design by eye are lost. So I'm really keen to keep that side of things going. I love designing by eye. Prefer to work off of a an, an established image or prefer to create your own from a blank page? 
it depends what technique I'm approaching. Okay, uh, should, let me preface it. You can't use depends. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's unfair. <laughs> um, because it really does depend on it, on the technique. If I'm looking at black work or silk shading, your image is your guide. It is essentially your little Bible for what you're stitching. You are following that image. It doesn't matter if bits of it, when you look at them independently, feel a bit odd or silly when you've actually stitched them they will be correct whereas if i'm approaching a piece of gold work then i want a blank piece of paper and i want to go from there mm. so i have different design approaches for different techniques okay that's fair all right yeah the pens does work here now and then <laughs> <laughs> so how, how many techniques do you actively design I play with most techniques. Okay. I default to black work and silk shading. Those are my two favorite go-tos. Gold work is a close third, but I never seem to get the time for gold work when I'd like to. Um, there are some techniques I've always historically ignored. So canvas work is not my favorite, but I currently have a piece of canvas work on the go for a book, a friend's writing for Crowwood. And actually, I've gone from thinking it's a truly horrible, horrible technique to loving it. So, <laughs> <laughs> what, what is it? What is it about canvas work in Europe that it it people just don't have any interest in it at all? What is it about that? I think I don't know. I mean, my issue with canvas work is the pieces that I did on my apprenticeship. Whenever I touched canvas work, it just it was hideous. It was bad it was faulty it was just it was car crash it was hideous um so that's just i think i've mentally scarred myself with canvas work um, <laughs> um but i think we do have a very different approach to canvas to you guys um because we don't find as many printed canvases over here uh, we don't have as many interesting threads to approach canvas over here. So we've got to go hunting for stuff. So that's why a lot of us, especially RSN tutors, when we come over to the States, we go mad in canvas shops because we can buy all the threads we struggle to find. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. right. We take right. them all. So <laughs> I, I don't know. But, um, I do love visiting the States solely to go thread shopping. Uh, <laughs> Oh, we're kindred spirits. Uh, oh, thread oh, shops. Uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, and it all goes into my personal stash, which I ne then never actually use because I never actually get to stitch anything personally, uh, which is why I think I'm enjoying this canvas so much because it's never going to be a kit. It's never going to be replaced. And so I'm just hitting my personal stash and taking out all sorts of random stuff. So I think this is partly why I'm having so much fun because all the threads that I've gathered for years are suddenly... They're there, and I'm playing with them. Uh, so yeah, that that's been an enjoyable, yeah. enjoyable. One. Mm. Well, we gotta, yeah. Of course, that's the thing is, yeah, I, we take for granted all the threads that are available to us here in the states, and uh, don't appreciate that. Yeah, you guys just don't have access to them. Um, Not as easily. Um, when I started writing the black workbook, I knew I wanted access to some interesting threads. And I've got a friend who lives in Texas, and she and her husband went off to the thread shops, and we were WhatsApping in the shop. So she was in the shop sending me pictures uh, of what I wanted, and she did my shopping for me, and I sent her the money, and she shipped me the thread. And that worked quite well. <laughs> right. Yeah, you just I, need I, your own personal shopper then. It was. That's it was the... fabulous. She was like, what do you think of this one? What do you think of this one? And I was like, I like these. I like these. I don't like those. That's not suitable for this project, but I want them. Uh, and <laughs> she, just, she just did my shopping for me, and it was great. <laughs> yeah, you guys in the UK, I feel sorry for you. I feel like, yeah, like we should provide that function as an ongoing uh, thing. Just uh, uh, <laughs> we'll ship you whatever you want. Yes. I, I would love that system. That would be brilliant. <laughs> well, we can do that. Girl. We can do that. <laughs> you would be personal shoppers. That, that's fabulous. That's a that's market that I think needs to be tapped into. Yes. All right, oh, I'll definitely. work on that. <laughs> this is a side business for you to consider. Yes. 
Well, well, you know, and, and Beth's quite adept at it. So, yeah, that would work. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I, I yes, it's just too bad that all the shops are not local for me. That's the that's the problem. Yeah. I have to do all mine online. <laughs> you mentioned something uh, a bit, minute ago about a shading and black work, and it, I was we were saying before the show. I really got locked in in your book. And the name of your book we should mention is um, now covered up on my thing here. Ah. I was like, I don't know where my copy is. <laughs> <laughs> where is it? It's Blackwork and Burgery Techniques and Projects. There we go. Yes, new book. So, uh, so people, it's it's a new book that uh, is you can get a digital download, and then um, it's available in print next year. Is that right? No, it's it's it was due to come out on Monday. The stock of books that people have ordered from me turned up yesterday, so it is it is now printed, and I am shipping them out to lots of people. I think it should be available in the states as well. Um, so it is now published. Oh, good, just, because when right. I bought the digital version here a few days ago, the the printed one was not available. Oh, is it not? Well, I've let's just go with I've got my copies. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, oh, all right. So so oh, good. Oh, so wait, I hate to say this. It's it's now available, Gary. You can you can buy it a copy. Oh man. Sorry. Because <laughs> I really wanted the printed ver printed version. I'm I'm fine with this, but I really wanted to. Okay, so I I was just just ahead of the gun then. Oh, yeah. oh wait 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 no wait wait a second I take that back. It says this title will be released on July first, twenty twenty one. Yes. Oh. Oh rats. In the that UK, so I have it. <laughs> <laughs> See, that was what threw me off because that's exactly what I read was July 2021. I thought, why would you have a digital version out so far ahead of the print version? And you don't. Uh, no, I, I've got my copies. Um, they were due to have arrived with me on Monday, but they only turned up yesterday. Um, so I have actually got lots of copies. Um, okay, I, I, I'm going to go personally shopping for you and we'll do a little exchange after this is all done. <laughs> That's fine. I'm more than happy for that setup. <laughs> All right. So JenGoodwoodEmbroidery.com if you want a printed copy of this book. And you, yes. if, you're, if you're at all interested in black work, you want this book. It's very well done. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah. No, it, it's well laid out, well organized, uh, easy to follow, uh, all the descriptions, photos, the whole bit. But w I got locked in on one of the later chapters where you're talking about shading in black work and and how that works and my mind was equating that to needle painting in surface embroidery and uh, so i wanted to ask you know, how do you work that in your mind is it really a similar mental approach or is, are there distinct differences i i always start with looking at the image i'm going to be working from and i always think an image falls into different categories in how I'm going to consider them so if it's architecture how do the lines of perspective fall because that's going to have a knock on to the stitches you want to choose um, faces how much soft shading is there because ideally for a good piece of black work you need to have soft shading you need to have negative space you need to have very dark shadows um, there are all these different planes that you need to consider for it to truly work and look dimensional at the end. And that has a knock on to the subject matter. So as I say, perspective in architecture, animals, fur, feathers, different ways to approach things. So there's lots of different subcategories. So I always start by looking at a picture and deciding from there what I'm looking for in that piece. Okay. And then the other part that, amazed it always amazes me i don't know if it amazes me but i find it most interesting that when you get into deep shadows in black work that it could easily just be solid thread but yeah you guys always keep a stitch going and a texture going within those deep shadows and uh so i, I was enjoying reading about how uh how you pull that off with with some random stitches and going to thinner thread and and other things. That's uh, yeah, extra stitches going into the pattern to compensate and make it darker. So there are lots of ways of subtly changing a base pattern 
So I tend to think of patterns as base patterns. So the book is filled with lots of patterns and some of them have got more open space in than others. But the more open space there is in a pattern, the more room there is to change and play with that pattern to infill. So you can take your base pattern and change it into a new pattern just by adding extra stitches in. So there's so much flexibility in in how you approach filling stitches in, working in shadows. It's just that there's so many possibilities. Yeah, I, I, that's what was going through my head as I was reading that chapter was the, the flexibility within what seems to be a pretty rigid uh, technique is th there's extensive flexibility because you're talking also about as as you're going uh, from shadows to lighter areas and leaving stitches out to uh, start to open things up and let that uh, the ground cloth come through and uh, and then doing that randomly so you don't have some rigid line somewhere but uh, yeah I, you had me completely wrapped up in that whole process of creating and moving into and moving out of shadows it can be a really really organic process so although you're working with a very strict grid, the organic nature of how you shade is no different than if you were silk shading. That is a very organic process. Mm -hmm. So it, by eye, you are letting the image you're working from inform how you are stitching. So it's just being flexible in how you use stitch to achieve the finished image. Yeah. So, <laughs> I gotta, so, I gotta try. <laughs> I gotta try. <laughs> and so you use a variety of threads then too, a different weights than yes. just lots of different well, weights. So the thicker the weights, obviously it covers more of the ground, so it comes out darker. And then we've got the finest of threads, which are far easier to leave open space with. So it can give you a full tonal it's a full tonal recipe really you've got everything you need there to actually adapt a black and white image but then then you're a purist you say you're a purist and you, you stick to the, the traditionalist if i guess is the word you used but you're not opposed to uh to color in black work and, and no. mixing colors no, no, I think I, I'm, I'm a traditionalist with a bit of a twist, uh, but I do think <laughs> that, that there is room for colour in black work. Why not? Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, no, that's great, because I think it's fun to see what designers do with black work by introducing colours, and sometimes it's just one colour, uh, sometimes it's just little little splotches here and there. Uh, yeah. it's, it's fun to see that. And uh, and then sometimes it's just full Technicolor everything. And but historically, black work has been worked in reds and blues and greens, so it's not a new thing. It's 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 just that we do it in a different way now. Mm -hmm. So it's it's always had color introduced in. It's just been approached in different ways. Yeah. And then the other part that really it surprised me, but I thought it was really great, was when you described that using Ada cloth uh, was not only legit, but an excellent way to get started with black work. It is. It's not my chosen fabric for black work. But when I was cross-stitching, it was, it was the one I started off on. I think, to a degree, black work is a gateway needlework. If you are a cross stitcher and you want to move into something new, it's an obvious transition technique. And if you are used to working cross stitch on Ada, then obviously the first goes that you should be having with your black work are on Ada as well. You are used to seeing those pre designed squares. Once you are confident with that, by all means, move on to even weave. I think it's prettier, but it's a great way of transitioning over. Yeah, that's yeah, and I, I learned I learned um, black work originally on Ada and I think I didn't like it. I didn't like how it looked when I was done and I was very frustrated with it. Um, so now I've I've learned again how to do black work and and I'd like it better than when I first took my my first few 
stabs at it. And your book is, I was just looking at the introduction. It, it has, it's so, it's very, it looks very thorough on explaining um, how to set up and um, how to get started on it. And, I and that just looks. Anal. Um, <laughs> I want to make sure everything is covered. And um, one of my Tuesday mill students, bless her, she's done all the proofreading for this. And every time she finished a chapter, she'd go, that was good. I've learned something new. Um, so <laughs> I felt this was a good thing. Um, and I was like, but you knew this already. I've taught it to you. She's like, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I'm trying to make sure it really covers everything that you could need to get going from you know the simple steps to the slightly more complicated like a slate brain i want all of those in there because although it's a black work resource it doesn't mean it's not going to have useful elements that will cross over to into other techniques of stitching so i want it to be a useful book well it works it really works yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> now, so you mentioned a slate frame. I am hung up. I, I got to buy myself a slate frame. I really do. I just have to. So do you I, use that all the time for everything? Pretty much. If it's a small project and it's being worked quickly, I will work it in a hoop. But I am usually using a slate frame for everything. So that's part of the joy of having a studio is I've got a set of trestles set up at all times. Mm -hmm. And if I'm doing a big project, if I'm doing a new kit design, and I'm, say, filming videos to go with it. By default, it's going onto a slate frame, and I'm going to frame up properly. So I've almost finished the canvas at the moment that is on the slate frame. Then I'm going to switch it to a piece of Jacobean, so I'll be framing up some twill. So I always work on a slate frame because there is no better way of stitching. In my view, there's no better way of stitching. Got to try. I just got to try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just looks the, the the setup alone just looks so ominous that it makes me hesitate. But it's it's really it's not that bad. It really isn't that bad. Get yourself a good slate frame. Don't buy a cheap one. Um, it is one of those things that actually the more you pay for your equipment, the better it will be for you. I've still got the same slate frames that I started the apprenticeship with 20 years ago, and they're still going strong. You buy a good slate frame, it will give you a lifetime of work. Um, so it's don't, don't scrimp on it. Don't go for a cheap one. Uh, but it will get you so, it's, so many possibilities because you can get it, big pieces of fabric squared up, always on the grain, always tight. It's just lovely. <laughs> I love a new slate frame, fr yep. fully dressed. I just it gets me all excited, new piece of fabric. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, all right, I got to try. All right, now, now we're going we're gonna to run out of time here. Um, so we, we got to try some other things. When okay. you, you did a, a, an embroidery piece of a feather. Which one? I've got three. Oh, well, the one I saw was the one you stitched twice. Okay, yeah, that's the, the newer one, yes. Okay, and so when I saw that and compared them and saw the differences, then my first question was, what was the mental process the second time? Because you you clearly learned from and advanced from the first time. It was It was done out of necessity for two reasons. One, it's I like to offer a lot of my kit designs with supporting videos because I think it's a visual way of helping people learn. And when I stitched it to start with, I was on a bit of a deadline and it did not get filmed. So I needed to stitch it again so that I could film it. And secondly, uh, we don't know where the first one's gone. The last <laughs> time I saw it was the RSN with me and then lockdown happened. So it could be at Hampton Court, but we haven't seen it yet. It could be in my car. It could be in the studio. I don't know where it is. So I... <laughs> <laughs> I actually have it. I am a very organised professional person. Uh, <laughs> so that that was the reasoning behind it. Um, but stitching it again, I I tried not to look at the first one too much and just revisited from the the image and tried to sort of play with the couple of bits I wasn't happy with. Um, 
but I did find it very boring. I don't usually stitch the same thing twice, so I didn't enjoy it, but I did a better job of it. Yeah, well, that, see, that's the thing is yeah, to, to stitch something again, you know, nobody signs up for that kind of thing. So you had that yeah. imposed on you. But in my observation, the end product is much tighter and better. I, I agree. The end product far better, but I wouldn't do it again. I would definitely <laughs> not sure I actually organized myself the first time. Um, I think the first one, because it was worked on a bit of a deadline, I probably wasn't putting quite so much thought into it in the end. It was supposed to have been taught at the summer of school for the RSN in the summer, which obviously did not happen because we were all hiding from covid so um i needed to get it stitched so it could be given to them as an image so i just i think i probably rushed the end a bit uh -huh. second one it didn't have the same time pressures so and i was working in the studio so i was only doing it once or twice a week so also i was looking at it with fresh eyes uh -huh. probably taking that little bit longer on it giving it more consideration and not rushing all came together and made a better piece in the end. Yeah, so see, that makes it an excellent lesson in stitching any project is is just that. If it, Have a situation where you can uh, take your time and, like you said, you interrupt it uh, so you get fresh eyes on it and you end up with such a better product. And yeah, it's not often that I tend to work things on a tight deadline, so... Yeah, I wasn't really sold. There were bits of the first one I wasn't sold on. I think the mm. second one's prettier. I, I far prefer the second one. Yes. Well, it's just it, it was just interesting because you don't see that happen very often. Where uh, yeah. I think sometimes those of us who do do design work and do stitch for a living, I sometimes think we don't share our failures as much as we should. And obviously, misplacing a full piece of work. <laughs> Um, and I will always hold my hands up if I've if I've had an accident with a piece of work, if I've cut a hole, if I'm, I'm picking something. I, I think it's really strong to show that you have errors because no, no one who stitches professionally is always going to get it right. And hiding the fact that you make mistakes, it makes us appear... It makes us appear like we're infallible, and that's not true. So I really like owning up to my errors. So I know that was a small cock up, and <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to keep track of my samples next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, but it is it is really true that that uh, we learn as much or more from looking at errors or experiencing errors than we do from the successes. So it's a plus there. It is. I'm a big fan of things going wrong because it means you've got to assess why it's gone wrong, how you can make it better again. And there's always a little voice in my head. If I'm looking at a piece of work I'm stitching and the little voice goes, oh, you could do better. The second I hear that little voice, I get my scissors out because when you try and push through, <laughs> rescue it, you know you're still going to unpick it later on. <laughs> uh, so I, I I think if you've got a nagging doubt, if you think something's a little bit wrong, scissors, do it again, and always own up when you know that something could be better. And then owning your mistakes, I think it helps like beginners or people who are new in a technique they you know they think oh it's got to be perfect that first time out, and then they get frustrated. But if they see, oh, I'm, you know, you know professional people who are, you know, who do it professionally are making mistakes. It gives them, it, maybe it makes them relax a little more. It gives them permission to say, okay, it can yeah. It can appear more achievable, definitely, right. if you're saying, no, I've gone wrong there. Um, <laughs> and I will always admit, anyone who follows me on Instagram will find that, or, or Facebook, I'll put up videos of me taking scissors to things, or before and after. <laughs> and I'm not saying that my finished work is perfect, because I can always tell you what could have been better. But if I know it's driving me mad to a point that I'm always going to look at a certain area and go, you should have taken that out. As soon as you've got that nagging doubt, then it needs to go. So you've got to follow your gut instinct as well. There are definite times where I've stitched and just gone, you can do better. You really can do better. Um, there are pieces that I have unpicked so many times that the silk has disintegrated. <laughs> and then I catch the silk 
and then the calico underneath has disintegrated and you've gone or you've, you've patched that and you know that you've only got one shot left um <laughs> and i think that time but there have been times where i've been that frustrated with one area that it's just gone in and out and in and out until i was happy with it and i think sometimes having that need to just sort of accept when something's a little bit wrong is a good thing but also accepting that when you're learning everything's a learning piece and you are always going to be developing your skills and every piece you do the next one is going to be better it doesn't matter what you're doing the next one is always going to be better than the first yeah and you talk about time and time again in your book about sampling basically working on a doodle cloth trying things out before you put them in the uh, actual piece uh, that uh, that it comes across very clearly that that is a primary tool for you. It is. And it's something I push my students to do all the time. A, because if you put it in, you don't like it and you take it out and then you do something new, put it in, don't like it and take it out. It's very demoralizing. So if you can be certain of what you're putting in to start with, because you've sampled it, then that saves you a lot of time. But it also means you've got confidence in what you're starting. I still sample now. So down the edge of a slate frame, doesn't matter if it's black work, canvas, Jacobean, I will always have different stitches and different threads just down that edge where I'm just testing ideas out to see if they're going to work or not. Because why are you not practicing? Why are you not being sure of what you're doing to start with? Um, when I was looking at the RSN pieces for the book, there are actually two or three black work samples in the RSN's collection where they've been mounted so that the samples down the side can be seen. Mm. It's link should not be an alien concept. It's there to inform your work. So it's a tool. Use it. Sampling is brilliant. I think it's underused. It should be used far more by everyone. And as I say, I still do it all the time. I love a, just a little sample. It doesn't need to be big, just a little centimetre to be sure I like what I'm doing. And then you move on to the real thing. Yeah, well, it's underused. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think in most cases never used. Um, I, but you really got my wheels spinning as I as I read because I thought, you know, I, I really should do that because I, I get so focused on putting the thread in and getting it right in the piece itself. Oh, and who, pressure off you. you yeah. Know what you're doing first. Yeah. So right. yeah, it, it kind of changed my thinking a little bit there, yes. Oh, well, that's a good thing. That's something I would love everyone to sample more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, and I was working on a piece, and um, I did do, I was having problems with the stitch. And so on the edge of it, I did practice. I didn't, I, I needed more practice, but it it does help if you do a few, a few of the stitches, just a few, you know, get that rhythm going. Um, it, it just takes so much pressure off and they're right. nice things as well it's kind of it's the little blueprint of how your main piece has come to life it's you can backtrack its history I, I like the fact it's got these little <laughs> little history of what you've been thinking yes yeah yep okay w one more thing we're we're, you know, we're gonna have to wrap up here pretty quick I had never oh, I I'd never <laughs> heard of reverse black work and that lion. Oh, uh, I, I, it's an idea I'd had for a while. And it's something I still want to explore more because I still don't think I've mastered it. Um, but that lion, I found the image and I knew he needed to be white on black. And I stitched half of him before I realized it was fundamentally flawed and unpicked the whole thing and did it again. And it worked that time. But that's because I didn't sample my threads enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay now now you have to you have to can you explain this a little better because that i haven't seen what do you mean by reversed black okay. work reverse black work standard black work we are stitching our black shadows onto white fabric reverse black work is where you are stitching your white highlights onto black fabric so you are having to completely reverse your thought process oh. and it really really was a mind bender um it must have been <laughs> on my slate frame for a year and as I say half of it was stitched and I just scrapped it and did it a second time but I love him 
he he really did work very well but he took so long to get right so it, it's something I'm still exploring with I do want to do more of because I think I could do better but I think for a first go he's fairly presentable <laughs> oh yeah it's uh when when I saw the lion I thought boy that's that's a beautiful piece of embroidery nice job and then when I saw that it was a reverse yeah it, I, I just stopped in my tracks and because exactly that, my mindset, wait a minute, she took a black piece of cloth and stitched just the highlights and let the black be what would normally be the black work. Yeah, it was, it wow. was, I pretend it wasn't a challenge. It was, but I do love him. He hangs in my studio now with Hootie, um, who's the owl. Um, I like all my animals and people. They all have names. So he's called Laszlo the Lion. Uh, but my favourite part of him is is it's so wrong, but his mane is a Bargello-style darning pattern. And you don't see that it's a Bargello-style pattern until you look really closely. And that gives me great joy that he's got this big Florentine mane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice. I, I I figured you'd seen that, Beth, because I knew that one would flip your switches. Yeah. Yeah. See, no, I, I, it's because is it in the book or because I, we have to send people to it. It's on Instagram, um. So I've tried to drip feed the big pieces onto Instagram as well, but he is in the book. Yeah. Okay, popular. I'll have to look him up. Yeah. Yeah. Because I didn't see him, or if I, yeah, I'll have to go back and look for him. Well, now I got to study the main. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, you've got to look for it. You don't see it straight off, but I'm, I think sometimes you need to think outside the box. His mane should not be a fancy Bargello style pattern. You'd think it's too floral for a big, strong lion. But it was one of those moments where the little voice in my head went, that could be interesting. Mm -hmm. And I tried it and it worked. So I, I love that, that he's got all these hard patterns and then it's really <laughs> sculpted mane. <laughs> but it works. It works quite well for him. So I'm really pleased with how he looks. Yeah. Do you see that technique? Uh, obviously, you said you wanted to work more on it, but do you see that becoming something you use with some regularity? I think so. I think my next approach is going to be a simplified down one. I've got a design for a kit that I'm going to have a go at because I think it would help me get my head around the technique further to do something slightly simpler rather than delving into a really massive, complicated uh, image like I did. Um, I think that my next... <laughs> I, yeah. I love a challenge. Yeah, you, you definitely that. jumped into the deep end on that one, yes. Yeah. yes. I'm a big, big fan of working a challenge, but had I known what I was getting into, I possibly would have stepped back. Um, <laughs> so I'm thinking something simplified down a little bit, just so that I can get my head into the process a little more. And then I, I, I definitely want to play with it some more because I, I really enjoyed the finished piece. And I say I love a challenge, trying to get your head around the reversing. Yeah, there was a lot of thought in it. I yeah. think there's a lot of room and wiggle room and development of that technique, the reverse style, that I do want to explore further. But it's it's finding time to juggle between pieces that I see as art pieces and pieces that are functional as in they bring in my living so the right. art pieces are never going to be the ones that make me rich i mean kids are never going to make me rich but they pay my bills so i've <laughs> always got to weigh up those two sides of of my my business so right. it if i'm going to approach a slightly simpler one next while i find the right image to throw myself back in again so i wouldn't rush into doing it again because i want the right image but i'm definitely it's it's there waiting for me to go back to i'm gonna go back to it yeah well it's amazing absolutely amazing yep thank you <laughs> now do it you just makes my brain hurt to think about it <laughs> <I'm ditching> it. <laughs> yeah that, that would be yeah you would have to be uh, conscious all the time of what you're doing i gotta believe that's um it, it really was it was a it was the sort of project that I got to the end of the day and I knew I'd been thinking. So there are so many things I can sit and stitch without, I don't want to say without thinking, but it's so habit forming that I look at the image I stitch, I look at the image stitch. 
that it was something I had to always be conscious of thinking the other way around. So I always got to the end of the day and knew I'd been working. <laughs> yep. Now, are you are you one of those that you go to the mill and stitch and work during the day and then when you go home at night you want nothing more to do with it or does stitching continue in the evening because it's just relaxing a bit of both i will always have at least one stitch project at home i am trying to make myself do other things so i'm not just stitching 24 7 so i do have some other elements of, of hobby that i like to play with so i try and always have at least one lego project around (laughs) <laughs> because I find it really soothing and something I've always wanted to study and I've gotten into during lockdown is I've started taking geometry classes, which obviously then feeds back into the world of black work. And so I've been doing a lot of technical geometry learning and painting. So I'm trying to get away from stitching all the time. Uh, but at the moment, I can see three different projects at home around me. So <laughs> there are always projects nearby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Cause, well, because you do, you have to have, you have to switch your mind to something else. You can't just do that all the time. Yeah. No, I. If anything, I tend to do more of the kit work at home, and actually, I do the fun stuff I really enjoy at the mill, which probably sounds backwards, but I associate the mill as my fun place. So yeah. I do projects there. I got to get to that mill. I'll tell you, Beth, feel, right. road trip, Beth. <laughs> road, road trip, definitely a road trip. Yeah, now, that would be that would be way too much fun. We would have, oh yes, yep. yeah. I just so it, yeah. <laughs> the silk weaver and the screen printer, and then she said natural dyer, and I'm like, okay, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> Let's <Wow>. go. <laughs> All right, there we go. Road trip. Yep. Jen, thanks so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me on. It's been joyous. <laughs> yeah, just a fascinating world you live in. I'm glad to share it with you. That We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Yep. All right, and thanks to everyone for listening. 